Hi, and welcome to the LMG webinar and Red Team Alliance webinar called Eating the Cybersecurity Elephant, How to Tackle Seemingly Insurmountable Challenges and Conquer Them. My name is Natalie Adams, and I am your moderator for today. Before we start the program, I would like to give you some housekeeping information. First, we encourage attendees to use the computer audio feature of this webinar. During the program, should you experience any audio interference, such as static or intermittent audio due to a busy network, please use the optional phone connection, which is listed in the audio tab of the webinar interface. Second, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the program. You may submit questions anytime by using the QA tab in the webinar interface, or you can save them until the end. Next, the video of the webinar and handouts will be available after the event. All attendees will receive a notification once the video is live, which also includes links to the supplemental files. Feel free to download these helpful files for your reference later on. And last, but certainly not least, a survey will be available to you at the conclusion of this webinar. Please take the opportunity to provide feedback on your webinar experience. Our presenters for the webinar today are Sherry Davidoff and Deviant Olaf. Sherry Davidoff is the CEO of LMG Security. As a recognized expert in cybersecurity and data breach response, Sherry has been called a security badass by the New York Times. What a great title. Her new book, Data Breaches, Crisis and Opportunity is available now. Her professional experiences are featured in the book, Breaking and Entering, the extraordinary story of a hacker called Alien. Sherry is a GIAC certified forensic examiner and penetration tester, receiving her degree in computer science and electrical engineering from MIT. Deviant Olaf, while paying the bills as a physical penetration specialist with the core group and the director of education for Red Team Alliance, Deviant Olaf is also a member of the board of directors for the US division of Tool the open organization of lock pickers. His books, Practical Lock Picking and Keys to the Kingdom, are among Singress Publishing's best-selling pen testing titles. Deviant is also a SAVTA certified safe technician and GSA certified safe and vault inspector. Deviant conducts physical security training sessions for Black Hat, the SANS Institute, the FBI, the NSA, DARPA, and many others. At this time, I will be passing Sherry and Deviant control of the webinar. Thank you so much, Natalie. I am just extremely excited to be presenting today with my friend and colleague, Deviant. Um, our roadmap is, uh, as you see on the screen, half physical security and then half cyberspace. Um, and really, those two are joined. Um, Deviant is, of course, an expert in physical security, and he'll be sharing ways that physical security systems fail and then how you can tackle that elephant of a problem and fix it. We'll be giving you tips along the way. My specialty is data breaches, and so we'll be digging into a famous data breach and showing you the problems that led up to it and, again, how you can tackle these problems. Um, with that, oh, I'm also excited because one of the reasons why Deviant and I are collaborating is because we have an upcoming class, Cybersecurity Cross Training. This is a week where I am teaching the Data Breaches class, November 17th and 18th, and he will be teaching uh, Attacking and Defending Electronic Physical Access Control Systems. So you can take one, you can take both, and learn how to defend your network and your physical security systems in an efficient and effective way. So with that, Deviant, why don't you take it away? So yes, the the idea of you know eating the elephant, why we are talking about that, and and the way I'm going to present this is kind of what I call going to your dangerous place, and they're very related themes. The seemingly insurmountable task, the something that is so big that it's easier just to put it out of our minds and be like, well, there's there's no way we could possibly sort out all the things that are wrong with X. Therefore, it's easier not to think about it, and then it's not a problem anymore. But that's not really that's not really possible, and that's really something that I had to face given my career. So my job is a hoot, right? Like I enjoy what I get to do, 
For those who didn't catch it in the intro, I am not just a technician in the physical security world. I run a covert entry team with my partners at different firms. We don't belong in this server room, but we have broken into this server room. We do physical assessment. We do physical adversarial emu emulation, physical penetration of buildings. And for the most part, my contributions to that team are very mechanically inclined. I'm a real kinetic kind of guy. That makes it easy and fun to do various attacks, like maybe we just have some hinge pins, and we want to knock these hinge pins out of the door with a tiny attack tool and pull the door off the wall and walk through. Or maybe there is a door that has an improperly hung you know, frame, so you have a latch that's exploitable with these any of these little bypass tactics sometimes you see these shared on social media of me slipping through you know bank doors and company doors if anyone has ever seen the famous under door attack right so this door is locked i'm not going to attack anywhere near the lock i'm going to reach up and beneath it i've got a long arm tool i can yank the handle that's on the inside since the inside handle is not secured typically and there we go. That's the level of attack I would typically perform, right? Stealing the keys from a security vehicle. Like, sure, that makes sense to me. Mechanical locks, mechanical keys. I can covertly copy the keys. We have whole presentations about this. And it was pointed out that even my specialty, specialty trainings are very mechanical, right? I am a safe technician. I can perform safe cracking attacks the, the elegant, methodical way. I can perform them the noisier way. They are both fun tactics. And I enjoy each of them very much. Both methods are very sound and apply to what I do. But what my elephant was, my seemingly insurmountable problem, is the fact that not all locks are purely mechanical, right? Everyone at this point is aware, and probably more so around your company, reliant on electromechanical systems, physical access control systems where you have electronic door locks, like a big magnetic lock, Maybe you have a little electronic strike plate. This is absolutely not a mechanical system, although it looks like it. This is electronically triggered. You have, you know, a boopy RFID card. That's that's the hotness for years. You know, we don't use keys at this office. We all have badges to get in and out. That's great. Makes you all modern. But for me, for for you know the door kicker guy, I would look at system and be like, oh, okay. Well, they have an access control system. And that was just about my knowledge for the most part. I kind of vaguely knew that access control systems had all these vulnerabilities and they were exploitable. And I had other very qualified people on my team. In fact, the lead instructor for our access controls course, Bobak, is he's our main electronics guy. But every time I would encounter a system, I would think, all right, I better call Bobak. Because what was going through my mind would be basically this. Oh, it's a little uh, black box with a red dot on it. They have an access control system. And maybe I would see this and I would say, think to myself, huh, looks like they have an access control system, little black dot, little, little black box with a red dot. And I would see this and I would think to myself, where is my parking ticket? I don't want to pay the full $23. Oh, and they have, what is this, four access control systems? They have four black dots. Oh, oh this one's got a black, oh, this, this, this is a bar that lights up. Oh, but it's, that's an access control system. That was the essentially all I had. And many clients in this space who think about these issues, that's many times your relationship with it. You say, well, we've got that little black box with a red dot on it. We have an access control system. We're good, right? That's, that's what you're supposed to have. These are huge issues. The idea of, is my access control system vulnerable? How is it vulnerable? And for me as an attacker, the idea of, I have only ever known metal bits of metal and wheels and clicks and clicks and locks. Ones and zeros was not my bag for the longest time. So how do you approach the huge issue? How do you, let's, let's try to talk about devouring the elephant that is electronic access control. Well, one thing as the proverb goes, you, you do it one bite at a time. You take small bites, but what we're going to try to also let you do is focus on prioritizing where those bites are. Not every system is the same and not every element in the systems are the same and deserve your same priority. And in the end, we will remind you that as long as you're making progress, that is the goal. If, if perfection is your goal, then you'll be that person who's like, well, that goal is unachievable, and I guess we never have to touch our access control system ever again. Let's break a few things down here. So RFID, RFID and access control systems, there's a lot of terminology out there. And I'm going to throw a big list at you here. And many of you may be like, oh, I've, I've heard, do we have, is that the one we have? I think we have one of them. And my relationship to much of these technologies would be, oh, I've seen that name before. I've seen that name on badge readers or on credentials. 
But I really didn't know if they were good, if they were bad, if they were old, if they were new. I'll tell you this. You want to break it down into small bites. See everything in red that I just highlighted here? Absolutely everything red is completely broken at this point. They are wildly outdated technologies. They are beyond insecure. Anybody can basically kind of have turnkey, learn on the internet in 15 to 20 minutes solutions for breaking these technologies to the point where there are now handheld devices, not just the high-end ones that we use in our class, but from China, 50 bucks, the attack payload is built into this little plastic device, click, click, boop, boop, broken technology. Now, a couple more on the list I'll highlight in orange. Maybe you've heard of iClass, but your integrator is like, well, you're running iClass SE, security enhanced. You have the better iClass. Yeah, it's better, but the one, two, and orange, they have known vulnerabilities too. They have they are being more and more exploited every day, even uh, the original Desfire from NXP Semiconductor. Those are no longer considered, if you're standing up a new solution right now, if you have a new building and you're like, we need to get an access control system, I would not look into those because they are they are going to continue to be exploited more and more. These two in yellow, CIOS. CIOS is currently HID's flagship product. And Evolution 1 of Desfire had come out a few years ago as well as an upgrade. Those also have vulnerabilities. They are just not public vulnerabilities. Our network of researchers and some people that we are connected to in the industry, we have private working groups where we are talking about these and exploiting these technologies. Does that mean that you should call up your integrator right now angrily? Be like, you sold me a CIOS system. They, they probably didn't know. And I'm not saying that your world is coming to an end. I'm saying that if you get a new office next week and you have a call with an integrator and they try to sell you a CIOS system, inquire if that's the only thing they can offer. Of this entire list, Desfire's Evolution 2 is really the only thing right now that I would consider to have no known vulnerabilities in this in this landscape. And there is an Evolution 3 that's coming out, and XP is working on that, right? So I just gave you a bunch of terms, but how do they actually work? What's going on? Well, again, let's break down a few of the parts, and this will start to give you, again, you're not going to become experts at electronic access controls, but this will start to give you a framework that you can kind of wrap your head around when people approach you with, hey, have we ever considered testing this? Do we have someone on staff who's ever taken a look at that? You'll have a bit more of an idea here. So here are some players, right? You have an employee approaching a building and there's people there guarding the access to that building. Well, the man who just walked up, that is our credential. That is our RFID credential that wants to enter. And that's going to interact with a reader on the wall. The guard out front is the reader. Someone inside the building, the big boss lady, she is the door controller panel. The door controller panel is who actually makes all the decisions. The reader doesn't make any decisions. You're about to see the reader just relays information. The door controller makes decisions and then speaks to the doorman, the actual door hardware unit, if access is granted. So many credentials are straightforward. Most interactions, in fact, the reason so many credentials are badly broken is that the architecture looks like this. The reader is just sort of offering power. It's always looking to say, hello, is anyone there? Hello, is any credential there? Hello? And if a credential approaches, that RFID credential wakes up, interacts with the reader, and really just gives a little brief preamble and a facility code and number, that kind of thing. They say, hi, I'm user 43-1048. And the reader says, okay, I understand you. The reader does not make any decision other than to relay that information to the boss. And it says, hey, this number is here. This is what's called the PAX or Physical Access Control System, PAX payload. The PAX payload, that user string, gets relayed to the system. The system says, look this up in a table. Oh yeah, this person's authorized this time of day. We're good. Hey, doorman, open up. And there's your electric lock or your electric strike, opening the door, letting someone come in. If you have a system like Prox, this is the oldest technology in this space. And many facilities, most that I encounter, are still running Prox, despite it being wildly no security built in. This is what you have. So if any of these credentials look like credentials you have used or currently are using, or if any of these look like the reader on your building, you are running Prox. Uh, that is the oldest technology in the book and it is as simple as the interaction you just saw. Now, it's not the only game in town, 
there are other brands. We're not going to do a deep dive here, but maybe you've heard of, especially if you're more West focused in this country, the West Coast and into the mountain regions, Indala. Motorola's Indala technology got a lot of market share. They got acquired by HID. But the one of the readers you saw at the very beginning, the one with the four dots, that's Indala. Different technology, same functionality. The, the card has a little interaction with the reader, and then there's just a brief PAX payload that gets sent to the door controller. Cantec integrator, Tyco is the big integrator that Cantec is partnered with. Different technology. They have IO Prox. It sounds the same, right? Oh, it's Prox, right? Well, it's not exactly. It's not HIDS Prox, it's IO Prox. But again, I can spot these now in the field. If I see certain readers, I say that is, I, IOPROX is proprietary to just to Cantec and Tyco. If I see this reader, I know there's no other technology they're using. It has to, that's IOPROX, absolutely. And then I know certain attack chains that I can do to exploit it. I-Class by HID. These are, these are names you have heard of or seen on your credentials. Or maybe you've even seen readers that look like this. This is HID's like real flagship product with that light bar across the top, right? Their new line of readers all have this look. So I'm showing you all these different technologies, right? But how do the credentials differ internally? Are they very special? The answer is no. By and large, the reason you saw all that red on the chart I showed you is pretty much every electronic credential is like a manila folder with a piece of paper inside. If you open the folder, there's just that PAX payload. There's no encryption keys and specialty locks and there's nothing like that. There's the PAX payload. It's maybe saved in a different format, but your card just has a small string of numbers inside of it electronically, most likely. Let's say you say, no, wait a minute, Dave. You said there's a few that aren't broken yet, some that are kind of secure. Yeah, let's talk about the secure ones. The secure technologies, you can think of it as putting that envelope in a little locking bag and maybe even stuffing that bag in a safe. And now, to get to that credential data, to get to that PAX payload, you have to unlock the safe, right? So the card reader is there, a credential approaches, but this credential is pretty cagey. This credential does not just offer up to the world, anyone who sees it, here's my credential data. They have a little interaction. They have a little back and forth with some code talking. Maybe they perform a secret handshake. Okay, and they say, okay, we are, we are, I'm authorized to speak to you. I trust you. But what does this credential do? It offers up, ultimately, that same type of data format, a simple, small PAX payload, little data string that is kicked down the wire to the door controller. And this is where we'll start to talk in a minute about the vulnerability surfaces here. That second step, even though this is a high security user and open the high security door, let them in, that PAX payload is stored and transmitted down the wire in the clear. Now the old broken attacks, again, there are small handheld units that you can use to just clone someone's credential. You may have seen this kind of show, this shows up in fictional stories and in TV shows where if you're near someone, their card will just interact with you. If you have a device in your pocket, it's skimming them, just bumping into them, hip checking them, maybe at the coffee line. And there's the, all right, you've got their PAX payload right there. This person might get in and then you can of course do the same thing and say, well, sure, I am that user. I can just go ahead and get in, why not? And there's, we, have, we do this all the time in the field, right? If we want to get you know, someone's credentials, if we want to get up next to them somewhere, if someone's on public transit, if someone, as I said, is in a coffee shop or standing around at a bus terminal, this person, I can look at this person. This is me far away from this person. I can tell you that person's running hid prox. That person's card is vulnerable. I can grab it with a, just being near them. And then we can emulate and replay that card later. Here's us getting into a server room, just playing back that PAX payload to the reader. Because again, it's just a simple set of numbers if you know how it's encoded. Someone at a restaurant, the most vulnerable of all is we had a special device inside a briefcase and this one office, because you're seeing these pictures of people leaving the office with their card. And you say, well, we tell our employees not to walk around. When they go outside, they have to take their badge off. That's a good policy. There was an office that had that policy, but we got into the office in the lobby and we just waited in the lobby bathroom until somebody came along and had to do their business. We are literally catching them at their most vulnerable. And we were able to get their PAX payload that way. So those secure credential types though, you might say, well, I, I, you said there's secure ones. Are they the better ones? Are they good forever? Well, there are other vulnerabilities. Remember that whole secret handshake and all right, get the number. Your attacker, might not have the ability to interact with the reader. They say, oh, I don't know how to do all of that. 
but they don't have to. An attacker can just take the reader, the original reader manufactured by the brand of credential you use. They sell readers. That's the business they're in. If we weaponize that reader, we can just, again, get the backside of the, that second link. And this is what we'll focus on in the next few slides here. That second link, even if the reader is performing a whole secret handshake and I can't crack this credential, the reader is going to do what? The reader doesn't make logical decisions. The reader just shoots, uh, shoots a little PAX payload right out the backside down the wires. And we can listen to that. This is called, this, this is called the Wiegand vulnerability or the data backhaul vulnerability. So let's think about this. We've, we've tried to break down parts of a PAC system. And even if you're not the type of person who needs all of this deep knowledge, you understand a little bit of who the players are. Well, let's prioritize those players now for a second. All this time, we've been talking about different credential technologies and how cards interact with readers. But remember, what does the reader do? The reader tosses that PAX payload down the backhaul or the data lines on, behind the reader in a, a protocol called Wiegand. If you search or look around for Wiegand vulnerability, you'll see uh, this is finally getting traction in the industry. This is where you want to prioritize your efforts. By and large, this is the vulnerability that my team and others exploit in access control systems when we want to break in. Installing a sniffer device on the back side of the reader. This is, you'll, you'll see it right here. This is a reader we're going to take off the wall and we are not even, let's see, are we? Yeah, we're getting the video, very good. Yeah, we, we are not even disabling the reader. The reader's light doesn't go out. The access control system doesn't see a reader go offline. We are just going to clip a small circuit board that this is, we are the exclusive provider of this. I'm not trying to sell you on anything. It's not like it's out on Amazon just yet. But us, uh, you know, our team and some of our strategic partners have this little sniffer, right? There, there are data lines on the back side of the reader. And if we punch down a little circuit board, we are now in a position to listen in on that PAX payload in the clear. This is the priority that most people should be focusing on and they are not. Because it's hard, right? It seems like the insurmountable problem. If I install a sniffer back here, you say, oh my God, we've got so many readers and we've got so many door controllers. It seems big, right? But upgrading that surface of your network, upgrading the surface so that our little sniffer, our little spy is not in a position just to get your PAX payload and use it later, that's an important task. And there are people working in this space. There are solutions coming out that allow you to prevent this type of attack. What we do, by the way, it's, it's a brilliant solution. The little circuit board has a radio built in. We don't have to remove the circuit board later. We can just come to, to the vicinity of the door, interact with our sniffer and say, okay, oh, you've got some credentials? Yeah, well, go ahead and do a replay attack. Let me in the door. And the, the door controller knows no different. The door controller just sees a message with a PAX payload and lets us in. That again, that is the Wiegand data bus or the Wiegand protocol vulnerability. And attacking those lines, it's finally getting some attention. The idea that this is a surface that should be the priority. There are companies working in this space. Uh, there is actually a working group. There's a, the, the new protocol, by the way, if this is another buzzword for you, is OSDP, Open Supervised uh, Data Protocol. Version 2 has the secure channel. There is finally encryption on this back surface. So HID Global is working on this, Mercury, Cypress. These are big players in the industry. They are part of a working group. Bobic, one of our engineers, is part of that working group. And we're seeing people push out the idea that the priority has to be, yes, you might have the fanciest credentials in the world, but if you're not upgrading the backhaul, if you're not upgrading the data lines behind the reader, it's still just data in the clear, waiting for someone like us to steal it. And I am a big advocate of trying to make this simple enough that can inform others to make these decisions and inform people like me as an attacker to be better. So now when I walk around in the field, I don't just say, oh, it's a little box with a little red dot. Now I can look at this and I can say, they're running hit prox. I know exactly which cloning and replay attacks are available. I know which what readers to weaponize. I can look and I can say, oh, okay, this is applied wireless. This is AWID, different technology, same Wiegand. This, this is Cantec, this is IOPROX. They all look similar, right? But these are different 
vulnerabilities that are I can spot them. I can I have learned the this dumb guy over here, this dumb doorbuster has learned to identify clues in the field. Not only can I tell that this is an iClass reader, I can tell you their integrator is Johnson Controls. Huge player in the space. If you have a big name integrator or software house, another huge integrator, if you're working with Honeywell, this is integrated engineering readers that HID owns, but like, again, Honeywell, if your installer's Honeywell, they understand about OSDP. They've heard of it. If your technology is super ancient, like this is absolutely ancient in DALA, maybe you're in a, more of a rough shape, right? But having this knowledge, having this understanding, being able to ask, what is my reader running? Uh, this is Identive's Utrust reader. It's running MyFair, uh, but it's running MyFair Desfire Evolution 1. Not too bad. And I really, the fact that I finally started to learn this, I love that I was in France. I was at an NGO. My wife was speaking there. She does a lot of government work in Europe. And th I was looking around. I said, oh, I see you're, uh, you're running MyFair Classic on your readers. That's, that's interesting. It's a bold choice. And our host said, well, why? What, is, what does that mean? I said, well, I mean, it's, it's a pretty broken technology. He said, really? And he took out his card. He's like, you're telling me this is, they, they just upgraded these. I said, well, I mean, I'm not your integrator. I, I don't know what, you're, what, uh, what you, maybe you're doing something different, but it's, it's, it looks like it could be vulnerable. And he said, well, can you show me? I, are you, I'm, we're, at a, you know, we're at the coffee break in between sessions with world leaders. And normally a year ago, I wouldn't have been comfortable doing anything. I would have said, well, I mean, I've, I've heard. But because of the training that I've received and the good partnering that I have from other experts, I said, well, let me see. And I took out my laptop and I ran a few commands against the card. And I said, oh, yeah, this is completely not encrypted. Uh, do you want to – here, here, take it. This is a copy of your card. Why don't you go try it at your office later? And he was able to come back after the next lunch break and be like, yeah, that card totally opened my office. Um, we, we're going to have some different meetings about this. Thank you very much for telling us about that. So – Again, you're never going to be an expert at everything. You're never going to make your systems perfect in every way. But making progress and doing so by prioritizing where you take these small bites over time, that is how we tackle these insurmountable problems. I'm still very much a mechanically focused guy, right? I'm still the mechanical specialist more than anything on the team, but I've become comfortable with access control and electronic systems too. Uh, here is me closing out. This is, you know, this is not a mechanical lock attack you're about to see. This is just me approaching a locked door. There's clearly an access control system on the wall. It might look a lot like one that you've seen or are using at your facilities as well. If I open this up, that's a whole lot of wires on a circuit board. But I know exactly which wires do what. I know which jumpers to hit. I know how to bridge a circuit. And I can just bypass the whole thing. So that's if... If this Donnie dumbass can learn it, so can you. So I encourage you to get into this. I encourage you to start thinking about access control not as a checkbox. A, oh, we got that little uh, black box with the, 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 the dot on it. We're, we're good? Tell me we're good, please. And don't think of it as this insurmountable problem that you're like, oh, la, 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 I heard we're good, please. You can understand this. You can break it down. There is a lot more that you you are capable of learning. And I really, I really encourage you to try these new things, to get into electronics, even if you're not an electronics person, because I want you to stay safe out there. Well, Deviant, that was awesome. And as I am uh, pulling up my section of slides, can you tell us where did you get the key to that um, access control box in the last right. video? <laughs> right. So that, that last video clip at the end, you see me attack. The brand of system there is called Door King Systems, uh, super big player in the market, a lot of market share. Uh, Door King all use the same key. So it's not like I stole a key from a security guard's vehicle or anything like that. Uh, the 16120 key, I've talked about that in other presentations. A lot of hardware solutions are key to like. Uh, yeah, it's literally on eBay. It's on, it's on Amazon. There's actually a website started by a locksmith I know called hooligankeys.com. Uh, it's not a plug, I don't get a kickback from him, but I just think it's funny that he took a list of keys that I have been promoting in talks and trainings, and he's, he's like, well, I'm a locksmith, I can just start cutting these keys. So yeah, hooligankeys.com is where anyone who wants one of those keys could probably get it. Sleep tight. <laughs> well, thank you so much, um, that's awesome. So I have actually taken Deviant's class and I was so excited. It was fantastic. And I will never look at those little black boxes with the dots in the same way. It's amazing to see something so simple and understand the whole background behind it and the security vulnerabilities that go along with it. So definitely recommend taking Deviant's class. I kind of want to take it again. 
All right, so let's jump into Cyberland here. Um, there is one data breach over the past couple decades that has affected every single consumer in the United States, also had global ripple effects that we are still dealing with today. There were huge losses to the financial industry specifically, and as we know, if there's losses in the financial industry, those get passed along to consumers and to businesses. It revealed supply chain risks, again, which we are still struggling with. And even just this week, we saw the culmination of years worth of effort. Seven years ago, this breach happened, and we are still seeing solutions being put into place today. For a data breaches book, a free ebook, what breach is this? Type into chat if you know. I'll give you a little hint. Um, it was a credit card data breach, and I decided to focus on it today because credit card numbers and debit card numbers touch all of us. Um, most organizations process or store credit card numbers in some way, shape, or form, and even if you don't, you use them as a consumer, whether you like it or not. Um, so understanding how these breaches occur will inform all, breaches of all types of data, and it will help you to protect yourself and your family and your friends and colleagues. So Natalie, did anybody get the answer? Anybody want to take a stab at this? Deviant, do you have a guess? All right. Type saying right now, so many Gov people are saying, you mean the OPM hack wasn't the worst data breach? Oh my God. <laughs> right? All right, it was Target, the first modern data breach. Target was a very special data breach, and I'll tell you why in a few minutes. But um, in the Target case, 40 million credit card numbers were compromised. And over 110 million customers had their personally identifiable information stolen. Remember, Target collects a lot more information than your credit card numbers. They collect your shopping history. There was a whole scandal several years ago about a 17-year-old uh, girl getting targeted advertising for pregnancy, and her father was just flabbergasted and frustrated. And it turned out that she was because Target was uh, analyzing the information about her purchases. So 40 million credit card numbers, 110 million customers, that was the Target data breach. And at the time, it rocked the world. Today, some of the impacts that we see, literally yesterday, Discover went live with click to pay This is the end of a, not the end, but the current uh, pinnacle of a discussion and technological advancement that really was uh, sparked because of the target breach and the subsequent retail breaches that we saw. Um, so click to pay is coming out. We're going to talk about this a little more at the end. We saw the chip, um, chip and pin really getting pushed out as a result of the target breach. So it wasn't the elephant that we see, the cybersecurity elephant affects your business and your organization, but it can affect so much more than that. It can affect your industry. There's a whole cybersecurity elephant uh, globally as well. If it's not the, sometimes the gaps in technologies that create risk for your organization are not things that you yourself can fix. You have to wait for others in your industry to push for fixes. You have to wait for the global systems to develop and mature in order for the solutions to be accessible to you. And then you as a person and as a consumer in our world have cybersecurity challenges and there's ways that we can tackle that cybersecurity elephant too. Sometimes even things like managing our own 200 passwords uh, can seem daunting. So let's talk again about the, let's go back to the target breach and use this as our case study and talk about how it applies to us today and the lessons that we can learn. So to go back in time, let's first set the stage and understand how the target breach happened. The target breach started with a phishing email, not to a target employee, but to a vendor. In fact, I suspect it was a bookkeeper at a vendor. It was a little HVAC company called Fazio Mechanical out in Western Pennsylvania. And one person on that company clicked on, one person at that company clicked on a link and it triggered a massive explosion. So that person's computer got infected, and from their computer, the criminals were able to jump into Target's network. This company was a supplier for Target, and they used the Ariba system to, uh, to enter POs and invoices and just manage their supplier account. It turns out that the criminals were likely able to grab that password because this person's system was infected. So the system's infected, they grab the username and password, they log into Target's server, and then they discover that target server is not very well secured. They're able to jump from there into target's network and ultimately get to the point of sale systems, which target customers are swiping their credit cards in. And this was shortly before Black Friday, so the timing could not have been worse for target. 
Um, it turned out that the the point of sales, the hackers installed malware called the black point of sale malware on these point of sale systems. The systems were not as up to date as they could have been. There are newer systems that they could have installed, but they simply hadn't invested in those newer systems. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. Really, Target was normal for retailers. Target was, in fact, I would say they were probably even a little more advanced than most retailers were at the time. But this was not the most sophisticated and advanced malware. This was, according to Forbes, bargain basement malware. So there's a lot they could have done to protect themselves. And once the criminals got access to their point of sale systems, which you can see here on the left, they collected all these credit card numbers and they exported them to a dump server, one single server in Target's organization. They were able to steal usernames and passwords in order to expand their access throughout the network. So then they moved all the credit card numbers to a different server, which had access to the firewall. And they were able to push things out through the firewall and out to the criminal's drop site where it went out into the world and ultimately to the dark web. And on the dark web, there was a carding forum, which you can see here. This is a place where criminals buy and sell credit card numbers. So you can see there's a Meta MasterCard debit card number, which is going for $26.60, a Visa credit card going for $39.20, that's a Capital One card. And then there's a Citibank card, a gold card, going for $44.80. So the pricing of each card will depend on how fresh it is, what the balance is, you know, what the limit is. Um, in this case, you can see Capital One and Citibank, there's a little note that says dump or credit card number of this particular bank cannot be replaced or refunded. So what does that imply? Well, it, you could get a refund if you buy that card from Chemical Bank and it doesn't work. These guys care about having good customer service. This is the hacker economy at work. So anyway, these card numbers are flooding the hacker underground. They are out there. And normally what would happen in retail breaches before Target is that maybe the Department of Justice, the FBI would figure out, the Secret Service would figure out, somebody would figure out what was going on. And then they would quietly alert the retailer who would work with the major card brands. And then they would prepare a notification. Sometimes the retailer was named, sometimes they were not, sometimes they were not. But the bottom line is that they had a lot of control over the process. They would take their time preparing these notifications. I'm really sure they would not have chosen to make that announcement right before Christmas if they could have. Um, and again, often the retailer is never named at all. Those card numbers are just quietly replaced. All of that changed in 2013 because of this gentleman here, Brian Krebs. Brian Krebs was a longtime Washington Post reporter who eventually struck out on his own. And he got into cybersecurity and the dark web when his own computer was taken over and he decided to fight back. So he figured out how to go down to the dark web and he noticed this flood of credit card numbers just uh, out there on these carding forums. So he started to investigate. He also was working with um, other partners. He was working with partners at small banks or even in some cases, larger banks to get information and share information with them because they were all struggling with the same problem of card fraud. And so he figured out a process of linking stolen credit card numbers with the retailer that they came from. So again, until Brian Krebs, this didn't make the news. But when it came to Target, he figured it out, he published it, and again, there's this huge public relations explosion. Cards stolen in Target breach flood underground markets. Boom, out there. So what happened? Again, before Target, Bank of America, this is an example where Bank of America would just replace compromised debit cards and not tell you why or who they were stolen from. After Target, Target happened, and then Krebs started outing other retailers. Hey, Sally Beauty's hacked, P.F. Chang's is hacked, UPS is hacked, Home Depot's hacked. Krebs outed dozens and dozens of different organizations, and other reporters have started doing the same thing. Other reporters discovered the dark web as well as a, an amazing fodder for information. And that relates to us today. At, in the same way that the risk back then changed, and it did. Again, there was much more financial incentive for investing in cybersecurity after this became a risk. Today, we're seeing the same thing with ransomware. So before this year, last year and the year before, a lot of organizations were hit with ransomware and that never made the news. Financial institutions would get hit. Healthcare organizations would get hit. The ones that made the news were occurred where there were major operational outages and typically the public was served. So you might see hospitals, you might see schools, um, but quite often, in fact, more often than not, ransomware cases never made the news. Now, the hackers are talking to the media. So you can see on the top, hackers are saying that they stole millions of credit card numbers from Banco BCR, from a bank. 
um, Maze, the Maze Hacking Group just has a website and they put out information that they've stolen and journalists know to follow that website. Another hacking group is publishing full dumps of data stolen from a law firm. I've handled law firm ransomware cases many times in the past. Again, never made the news, uh, especially not for your smaller mid-sized firms. Now they do because those the hackers themselves are notifying. And even private companies are having their information, their intellectual property dumped onto the dark web. So the risk today is changing in the same way that the risk shifted back then. And we can learn from that and it's time to invest more. The damage from the Target breach was huge. Um, Target had uh, almost half their profits cut out, 40% of profits cut out for that quarter. And the CEO ended up resigning because of the Target breach. So your executive leadership team could really take a hit. Again, the same is true for today. The big news this summer was that Uber's former security chief, Joe Sullivan, was hacked or was charged, criminally charged for potentially covering up a breach, not notifying people about a, a data breach. Um, Gartner says that it's likely CEOs and potentially other executive members of your team could be held personally liable by 2024. So we're seeing those stakes rise and with it, our cybersecurity investment needs to rise as well. There are also ripple effects throughout our community and throughout our world. In the case of Target, their uh, credit unions and banks reported almost $200 million in losses just because of card replacement costs. There were other costs that were not factored into this. For example, many of them had to suddenly have um, employees work on Sundays and over Christmas break because they, had, they were helping customers deal with the problem and have their debit cards replaced. Also, the world ran out of card stock. Those little plastic cards, we don't have an unlimited supply of those. Literally, as you can see on the right, there's a card backlog because the world does not have enough supply to replace all these cards. So those are just a couple of the ripple effects that we saw. And again, today we are seeing new ripple effects. When BlackBot announced this summer that they had been hacked because of a ransomware attack, all of the many organizations, hundreds and thousands of organizations that were their customers, each had to conduct their own breach investigation and they had to notify millions of people in turn. So we're seeing bigger and bigger ripple effects that go beyond the hacked organization and affect all of us from one single breach. What can we do about this? Well, again, it might seem like a huge problem and it is, but let's talk about how Target handled it for their company and how globally we have managed to eat, not all of the elephant at this point, but a good chunk of it. What a gross analogy this turned out to be. Okay, so Target's security team knew that there were problems and they raised those issues in the months and years before the attack. You can see it documented. Also, many of them talked to the media off the record or quietly and anonymously. Um, Target CEO and other people in their executive team had to testify before Congress. And Congress actually produced a full analysis of the Target breach and laid out the steps that Target could and should have taken to have prevented this from happening. If your data breach ends up the result of the subject of a congressional investigation, you've done something wrong. <laughs> so let's talk about what they did. First of all, they gave network access to a third party supplier without fully assessing the risk of that. And on top of that, they didn't use two-factor authentication, even though password theft was and still is a problem. They, for many reasons, organizational as well as financial, they didn't actually require vendors to use 2FA on, the, on that system. Target also got plenty of warnings about the attack, which unfortunately they did not respond to, uh, or they didn't respond to effectively. And then the attackers were able to jump through Target systems from the Ariba system to the point of sale network and get those credit card numbers out, which means that their network was not properly segmented. Those are just a few things that were is issues. Passwords were also a big issue. After the Target breach happened, they did an analysis of account and password management and found that there were, there were huge password management problems throughout the organization organization. But Target ate that elephant and they ate it fast. Within just a few months, they put out a, a report saying, here's all the updates on our security and technology enhancements. And remember, their CEO has resigned at that point. They have full support from their new executive team. They enhanced monitoring and logging right away. They installed new point of sale systems that had, did application whitelisting so that you couldn't just install any kind of malware you wanted. 
They did enhanced segmentation, so they made sure to properly break up their network. They reviewed vendors and they limited vendor privileges. I'm sure that was a huge priority for them. And then they tackled the account security question. And I'm sure it wasn't all done by April, but they did a lot of it very, very quickly. They had to. The number one thing that helped them was that they got buy-in from their executive leadership team. And the chart that you can see on the screen here, on the screen here is a report from Deloitte and Touche. We talked about it in last month's cybersecurity and budgeting seminar. Um, but the number one thing that will set advanced companies apart is that they have leadership and board involvement. If you're going to need it, the, if you want to eat the elephant, you have to make sure your leadership team is on board. You can't just have part of your team saying, oh, I'm gonna go for the toes here. No, you, mean, you need to make sure you are a united team and that you have the full support of your board of directors and your leadership. Also, as Deviant said, you gotta break it down into small bits. And it's not surprising that the NIST cybersecurity framework was so quickly adopted. So it, around the, like right after the target breach happened, the United States government released the first draft of its cybersecurity framework, the NIST cybersecurity framework. And it breaks down cybersecurity challenges into five different areas, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And with each of those, there are these little sub areas. And then with each of those, there are specific controls so that you have an organized and prioritized list. I threw this news article in here because I think it's important to understand again how Target related to this. Because this came out literally in February, right after the Target breach, people paid more attention to it. Everybody in the nation had just been hit with the results of a data breach. People were seeing their debit card numbers replaced and feeling frustrated. Like, why aren't companies adopting cybersecurity measures? And then the, the our leadership, our nation comes out with a solution. So the headline says, retail breaches bolster interest in NIST cybersecurity advice. And it did. Very impactful. It's not enough to break down the problem into small bits. You'll just end up with a zillion small bits that you have to eat. You need to prioritize, again, as Deviant said. So make sure you understand the actual risks. Like right now, I am looking laser beam at, at ransomware. And what are the risks that you may get ransomware? What are the highest contributing factors? And how can you address those? So my top concerns for most companies right now are, are you using two-factor authentication? Do you have any exposed user interfaces that people could log into or that criminals could log into? Are you managing your passwords correctly? Those are like the top things to think about. So understand what the actual threats and risks are today and make sure that you're aligning your investment directly with those risks that you are spending, you're getting the most bang for your buck, you're spending money where you need to spend it. And as Deviant said, aim for progress, not perfection. You are, you may not be able to get the whole thing all at once, but we want to take it one step at a time. Also think about your suppliers. Again, Target revealed the risks posed by suppliers, and we cannot uh, be responsible for every single organization that is supplying us with technology or that is connecting to your network. So instead, you need to have a process for doing risk management of your whole community, of anybody that's involved um, or that you associate with from a technological perspective. The good thing is that the NIST cybersecurity framework was updated to include your suppliers. And uh, the things that you need to do includes prioritizing your suppliers based on risk, delegating your requirements through contracts. That is absolutely key. So think about all the people and organizations that you rely on and make sure that you have contractual requirements and that you're monitoring their risk, you're including them in your risk assessments, but you cannot do it for them. You must delegate. I don't know about you, but I'm a huge fan of Douglas Adams. Um, meeting him at one point was like the highlight of my of my teenage years. <laughs> and you need to put a, somebody else's problem field around certain aspects of your cybersecurity program. So for those of you that don't know, a somebody else's problem field is a cheap, easy, and staggeringly useful way of safely protecting something from unwanted eyes. Any object around which you put this field will cease to be noticed. So we do still need to make sure that they are uh, engaging in good cybersecurity hygiene, but you absolutely can put a little somebody else's problem field around, uh, around what suppliers are doing and just have them report back to you. So delegate cybersecurity responsibility and look at those reports, but you can't do everything yourself. 
So Target recognized that the challenges that they had were not unique to their organization. And in fact, the solutions that they needed in many cases had not been fully developed and they needed to get the rest of their industry on board in order to make the big picture changes that they needed to make. And this was helpful not just for them, but everybody else in our community. Um, here you can see how Target became leaders in the community. They've actually become a role model for cybersecurity. I've had many of them, uh, many of the folks from their cybersecurity and incident response teams in our classes and have always really loved working with them. They joined the retail and hospitality ISAC and they're actually part of the board of directors there. So again, leading the way and helping to push forward new cybersecurity initiatives. So really, um, really great to see how they stepped up and became leaders. And one of the things that came out of Target is a fundamental issue with the way that payment, with payment card authentication and authorization. Basically, think about how payment cards work. You have this number that's the keys to the kingdom and you must keep it really, really secret. But in order to use it, you have to give it away to like dozens of people all the time. Does that make sense? No, there is like a fundamental security problem that you could just drive a truck through this security model, right? It's very old and it's not effective. You can't just keep these secret and then give them out to lots and lots of people. So when the target breach happened, immediately some of the major car brands started coming out and saying, okay guys, we need to fix this and use EMV. That was the first solution that was proposed. And in fact, this launched a wave, this and the other retail breaches launched a wave of um, chip and pin adoption. It had to because the card brands made it a, re a requirement. For those of you that don't remember, there was a big push. And it helped for some things, but not for data breaches. So the difference between magnetic stripes and EMV, on magnetic stripe cards, the information is static. If you swipe your card, it's actually really easy to copy. It's really easy to read. With EMV, there's a unique cryptogram for every transaction. It is not so easy to read harder to, and more expensive to replace, by the way, if there is an issue. Um, but the bottom line is that EMV helps to, is very effective in protecting against uh, card skimming. So if you go to a gas station and swipe your card, there's a pretty good risk that you will have your card number stolen. Whereas if you're using chip and pin, it's a lot harder. The problem is that that's not what the problem is. In the case of Target, criminals broke in and put malware on their point of sale systems and chip and pin does not help with that. The criminals are literally lurking in the memory of the point of sale system after the chip is read, after the card is swiped, and they're grabbing those numbers out of memory and stealing them. As Brian Krebs himself reported, zero is the number of customer cards that chip and pin enabled terminals would have been able to stop the bad guys from stealing had Target put the technology in place prior to the breach. What we really needed was end-to-end -end encryption so that the card numbers were encrypted, or better yet, tokenization so that the card numbers were that never there in the first place. And tokenization, the technology to use it had existed. Tokenization is where you take a sensitive number and you replace it with something less sensitive. Does your merchant, do retailers really want to store your credit card numbers? Of course not. It's just risk for them. They do want to be able to process your payments and there's the, there's the uh, trade-off that they have to make. But Apple's a great example. Apple Pay came out right around the same time that the target breach happened. And it would have been a natural solution to this problem because when you use Apple Pay or any number of other um, contactless payment technologies, they include tokenization. So the card number doesn't get sent to the merchant. Instead, it's a token and there's a whole backend system that links it to you and ends up uh, taking money out of your accounts. So tokenization is key, but that wasn't adopted at the time. Why? Well, actually, I'll get back to that in one second. That's a mystery. Um, one important takeaway from this is that a solution is that you can make the problem smaller, right? So tokenization helps you to remove a huge amount of risk. So maybe we can just shrink our elephant down. If you don't have that sensitive information, those credit card numbers, you don't have to secure it and you don't have to worry about stealing it. And that is the number one way that you can reduce your risk quickly and effectively and cheaply. Hit that delete button. Delete your data, have retention times. If you can, abstain from collecting in the first place. Make sure you have a good disposal process and devalue your data. Substitute sensitive information like social security numbers with just random ID numbers or other numbers that make sense given the context. So make your elephant smaller, shrink it down by getting rid of your data. 
All right, I had to throw this in um, I, because Deviant has helped me collect some of these pictures. So <laughs> merchants did not immediately adopt EMV. And that made sense because EMV is expensive. There was a whole big certification process that made it difficult to do. It caused delays in the checkout process. And guess what? It didn't actually increase your security all that much. Encryption and tokenization were what we needed. Um, I love this. If you look in the bottom right, companies were even making, having like custom made cards that said, please swipe, no chip. These, these uh, terminals, these brand new terminals that people were buying just sat on counters and lingered because the certification process was so arduous. So why were they adopted? Well, because of who owns the chip, chip and pin, EMB. It turns out that EMB is owned by the card brands. American Express, Visa, MasterCard, JCB, Union Pay, and Discover. And so there's this whole big power struggle, struggle that happened because of the target breach. Literally, you can see in the fallout of this, the card brands are saying, we need chip and pin. And other people are saying the chip is expensive and it's not actually solving the problem. And in the end, everybody won. EMV adoption is up today. Finally, the card brands did successfully push for the adoption. Uh, unfortunately, it did divert a lot of resources from other payment technologies, but it also reduced the risk of um, card uh, of um, skimming, of card skimming and things like that. So, you know, there's good things. The problem is that when criminals have a harder time stealing your card in person or using it in person, guess what? They're just going to use it online. So we see the volume of uh, card not present fraud in the United States going up and up and up, correlating with the deployment of uh, EMV chip and pin systems. So criminals have a hard time in the physical world. They're just going to go to the virtual world and attack e-commerce sites. And you can see that in the numbers. This is from the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. You can see the green line point of sale breaches going down and down and down and web application breaches going up and up and up over time. Those are e-commerce hacks that are occurring. Good news, again, I know it's hard to say good news on a slide that has COVID-19 on it. The good news is that contactless payments are finally up. We have rocketed into the future this year. If there is a silver lining in cybersecurity, of the COVID um, of the COVID crisis that is occurring, it is that people don't want to touch payment systems anymore. And so, co contactless payments are now used by 80% of the people in the world, a 40% increase just this spring, and there's probably been an even bigger increase over the summer and fall. We don't have numbers on that yet. So now that we're using contactless payments, it means that merchants are not getting as many credit card numbers, which is reducing the risk for everybody. And we're also seeing click to pay. This is again kind of the car brands have had time to adopt some of these modern technologies like tokenization and passwordless checkout that we really need them to. So customers were getting their passwords stolen. Click to pay facilitates passwordless checkout and device based authentication. It also facilitates tokenization even in e commerce sites. So this is great news. It means there is less information to steal. We've shrunk down our elephant and you should see more news about this over the coming year. Just yesterday, Discover went live with click to pay So they're the last major car brand to go live from what I've seen. Um, and this, this will have big consequences for cybersecurity and hopefully dramatically reduce the risk for everybody. So our last takeaway here is be brave, adopt new technologies. You as a person, as a leader, as a consumer can make a difference here because we need everyone to start adopting these new technologies in order to reduce the risk for companies and for the whole system. Many times it's uh, the adoption of new technologies, whether it's two-factor authentication or click to pay or a mobile wallet, many times those get hung up because people don't wanna change and either employees or consumers struggle with that adoption. So we all need to make sure we're educating our communities and individually each one of us needs to be brave and push forward to use them. So to summarize, how do you eat a cybersecurity element, elephant? Get leadership buy-in. Make sure you're breaking the problem into small bits and prioritizing. Again, I think Deepan and I are on the same page with these. Make your problem smaller. Delegate responsibility. Put that somebody else's problem field around it. And be brave. Adopt new technologies. So with that, I think we have just a couple minutes for questions. That was fantastic. Yes, thank you to you both for such a great presentation. We do have a few questions. If anyone wants to add any more questions, please let us know. The first question that we have is, 
from Mark. He's asking, can CSO, CTO, CIOs, et cetera, purchase professional liability insurance if being held personally responsible? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, you know, honestly, I, I really love following the trends with cyber insurance. I believe often um, executives are left out if they're considered negligent or they're excluded. Uh, but that's a really good question that I'd love to research. Drop me a line on LinkedIn and we can connect about that. Great, thanks. The next question is for you, Deviant. How do I know if my access control system is running Wigand or OSDP on the back end? And how can I upgrade if necessary? Yeah, so that Wigand interface, the, the short answer is yes, it is. I'm almost positive. Unless anyone has taken steps to change it. Um, if your access control system, first of all, is using an older technology of credential, I showed you some of the, and again, you weren't taking notes on this, but those galleries of readers, 90% of those readers simply do not support anything other than Weekend. Uh, or they might support something even worse and older in the clear, like RS-485 or something. But the OSDP protocol, in order for it to work and be encrypted, you know, the reader has to support it and the, the door controller panel has to support it. Uh, that's the only way, if you're gonna speak this new language, both ends have to support it. HID, HID Global, is pushing firmware for a lot of their product line that will support OSDP. Uh, they were one of the, the best adopters of this, actually. And the door controllers have been a bit harder. Now there are major brands who are supporting it. For a long time, though, what was needed was a little middleware device uh, where you could just put this little, this little extra device in line with the door controller as a small translator in the wiring closet. And that would be enough to, to now the HID reader needs it, but that's essentially it. If you're running anything other than a pretty recent generation of product, you do not have an OSDP2. Even if you are running new product, it may not be turned on with uh, encryption on OSDP2. All right. Thank um, you. Natalie, before you go on to the next one, I forgot to remind everyone, we do have our cyber cross training event coming up and we created a code. So if you want $50 off, if you want to register, go to lgsecurity.com slash cross and you can use that code on the screen. Um, or if someone at your organization wants to take one of our classes, um, please do. We'd love to see some of you there. Absolutely. As you can see from the Chiron on my screen, news reports uh, are telling us from many sources <laughs> it is one of the best trainings ever. That is adorable. That is some really great news and I'm not surprised by it one bit. Uh, thank you to the both of you for such a thorough presentation and for answering those questions. For those of you that have any more questions, please feel free to drop either of these presenters any questions or comments on their personal social media sites. They're both very active on social media. So on behalf of Sherry and Deviant, I wanted to say thank you for attending this webinar and please take a moment to fill out the survey afterwards and let us know what you thought of today's presentation. The recorded video from this presentation and the handouts will be made available to attendees and we will send out a notification once they are live. Thank you to everybody and have a great day.